Mindset Athlete Podcast and I'm your host, James Roberts. I'm a two-time Paralympian and owner of James Robert Fitness, which is an online training, nutrition and mindset coaching business. First of all, I'd like to thank Lauren Williams for suggesting this quote to the show. An athlete is a mindset. It's how you prepare, think and execute. Not because of some elite status or physical stature. Anybody can be an athlete. By Chris Hart. And each week on the Mindset Athlete, we like to bring you inspirational athletes, a message or experts talking about human optimization to teach you how to change your perception of your mindset and become 1% better. And on today's show, I've got Donovan Martin. Donovan helps professional athletes in America's biggest sporting leagues to remove mental barriers and reach the highest level of performance. He's worked with NFL and NBA players, Division I collegiate athletes and national level prep athletes. Donovan has spent two decades researching, studying and working with high achieving individuals. However, in his, in his early 30s, a kidney cancer diagnosis helped to crystallize his passion for improving mental performance. In the face of anxiety that com- accompanied the disease, his own performance at his practice and with his family suffered. In tandem with his physical recovery, he overhauled his mental approach, gaining tactical performance knowledge in the process. His dedication to growth under pressure and improving results in sports performance has earned him the reputation as the mental performance consultant for high achieving athletes. So welcome onto the show, Donovan. Thank you very much, James. Appreciate it. So beyond my initial introduction that I have given you, is there any little nugget that you want to add to, to my and give to my audience? Well, I think the only thing I like to always start with is that my all my approach is foundational and, and it comes from all the research in clinical psychology. And I see a lot of people out there that, you know, they, they gain their understanding, their perspective, and they try and help athletes. Um, but I'm I'm particular to this clinical psychology approach because clinical psychology takes on both sides, right? It takes the it takes the approach of all the science, so you have to know all the theory and all the research and controlled studies, and then you have to know the outcomes of all that, and you have to know how those uh, how those uh, experiments are constructed and how that data flows, and then the real key piece is how do you apply that? So. You know, one of the things I tell people is all my trainings in clinical psych and and by license and training, uh, you know, I'm a clinician, but it's not touchy feely psychology, right? It's not sit on the couch and and tell me how you feel and what happened when you were eight and all that. This is this is very serious research that we know high achieving people work a very specific way, and and you got to get away from the idea that the terms like anxiety mean problem or good or bad. You want to be an anxious. If you're a high achieving person, you are an anxious person. That's by default. We know that it's it's a proven fact in psychology. So it's what you do with that knowledge and how you regulate yourself and become aware of yourself. That's the key component. And that's why working with high achieving people, they understand that they understand, Hey, I need to take this knowledge. I need to take this application and I need to practice until I get better at it. And so my approach is really streamlined. It's three to five visits. Um, it's real intense work. Um, we get on the field. We get in the weight room. We apply everything we talk about because I challenge anybody that I work with, if you don't believe what I'm saying, go look it up. Just go look it up. Prove me that I'm wrong because I love to be wrong. That's how I keep to keep learning. That's the whole thing about being – in science and being a clinician is it's not about proving yourself right it's about growth and growth includes some being wrong you know and that's okay so i think the thing i really like to emphasize is yeah it's clinical psych but there's no there's no like touchy feely part of it it's it's how you're going to get after it and how you're going to be a high achieving person and that's and that's what we want so do you think there's still a bias then towards clinical psychology then in terms of it, people associate it as you're going to still be on the couch? Yeah, I think, I think people um, have their reservations about it. I think, I think 
athletes and high achieving people have this stigma uh, where they should be able to achieve and solve it themselves and why would they need some guidance from somebody who in their eyes you know I've never been in the NFL I'm never going to be in the NFL um, I didn't play division one football but I don't profess to know those things either you know I'm a fan I love football I think it's amazing I love everything about it um, as far as like the sports side, there's some politics side I'm not a big fan of, but uh, the sports side of it, I love the sport of football, but I am not a football player. I'm a clinician and I understand how the mind and the emotions work in human beings that play that sport at a very high level because I've researched it, I've studied it, I've tested them, I've gathered data, I've failed, I've reworked the problem a dozen times for 20 years to come up with these very basic but highly effective models that help these people that are already high achievers become high achievers in other areas of their life. So it's about being how, how good can I be in all aspects of life, not just on the football field or, you know, at my profession. But do you think the, the athlete to some degree, and I'll profess that I would include myself in that as well when I was in that, that arena, do they think they don't take that step back to look at the bigger picture in terms of I can go it alone, but they don't realize, be it, you know, the brotherhood of it being an American football team or being in a team in general, that still support, be it the coaches, the team managers and the other players around them. It, is it because they don't relate to the two as being tangible? I think so. I mean, I I guess that'd be a little different for everybody. I think, like, one thing I talk about is in American football in the NFL, you have 53 players on a football team. But on average, over the past 10 to 15 years, 58 players get arrested every season. So if you think about the way anxiety works, and, and there's a model that I teach athletes that Anxious people typically want to control things or they want to avoid things. And it's the combination of how much control and how much avoidance do I have? Well, when you're in that sport environment, you have a lot of control and you're able to avoid a lot of things because it's a, it's kind of a closed environment. It's this network. It's this brotherhood, like you said, and you can relate to all these guys, and your teammates and your coaches. Now you step out of that environment and you go home Why do you think, if you think control and avoid here, the two things NFL athletes get arrested for, domestic abuse, control, drugs and alcohol, avoidance. Okay, if you knew how to regulate your anxiety in your marriage without control or avoidance, you probably wouldn't end up getting arrested. If you knew how to regulate your anxiety off the field without using drugs and alcohol, you probably wouldn't get arrested. So. It's learning like, okay, in this one part of my life, my anxiety works really well and it makes me great. But in this other part of my life, the exact same thing that makes me outstanding is going to be my downfall. Okay, well, we can't have that because it's about being a high achieving human. It's not, it's not about being a great football player. There's plenty of great football players that go broke within years of retirement. There's plenty of great football players to make stupid decisions and get themselves in lots of trouble. And there's a lot of reasons that go into that. You know, in American football, it's really hard to get out of that survival mindset when your entire life you've grown up in a world where you have to be in a survival mindset. So you just got $30 million and they don't understand how they react to that paycheck. Well, you got to think like four of their people, have been killed. 11 of their people are in prison. They've never met a lot of their family. Um, You think $30 million is going to make them all of a sudden work different? No, they're, they're still going to be in that survival mindset and that survival mindset made them great football players. So it's really hard to get the mind to change when that's what it becomes conditioned to do. So you got to learn the skills and techniques to rework that problem. But then, Donovan, as well, does the, the, the financial reward that they receive, does that sometimes magnify the, the problem? 
Well, for sure. Yeah, because you don't approach that problem. Now you have all new tasks and you have people that want to help you. But do you know how to trust those people? Should you trust those people? Um, and so it creates a whole new set of circumstances. And quite frankly, there's some great companies out there. Um, Rise Sports Advisors, you know, we, we, um, I think they're outstanding at making sure these football players are, are they understand equity and investment and they're taken care of and they develop these different programs like Jalen Smith has the MEI, which is a wonderful thing where it's actually helping minorities become entrepreneurs. Uh, and these are all great things, but you have to be with the right people to be able to develop that. And that's just not widespread. It's kind of like what I do with mental performance. I've never met an athlete or a team or a person that's against mental performance, but it's, it's the minority. It doesn't happen to a large degree within the league. So, you know, um, those that, that receive that help and have that guidance and that support do pretty well, but the majority just don't have it. And that $30 million or whatever it is creates a whole new set of problems that they're just not prepared for. But does that come down to fear of the unknown then? And obviously the, the real undertone of it. Right. So everything in, in anxiety work has to do with this thing called the sense of impending doom. And that's really how they write it in the literature. And that, that's that unknown, right? And so you can have anticipation go two ways. You can have dread. Um, you got to go have a root canal. Oh, man, that sounds awful. Or you can have excitement, you know. And, and sometimes you get a mixture of both. You get that fear and excitement feeling all at the same time. But the unknown is the hardest thing for anxiety um, to cope with. And anxiety perpetuates the unknown because anxious people think in all three phases of time, past, present, and future. So, you know, they know where they came from, they know where they're at, and then they can forecast all these, you know, what ifs into the future. Um, and most of those never come true. Um, but you, you think they will. And some of them, you'll, you'll actually create a self-fulfilling prophecy where it'll make them come true. So, yeah, the, the unknown is, is by far the scariest thing when it comes to the anxiety work. But if, if somebody was certainly sent a, a realist and actually looked and took a, be reflective and took a step back, mm -hmm. sport's not a controllable uh, um, outcome. Okay, you, you, you dictate by um, how you play the game or what, be it what sport on how the result will go, but you can't predetermine the outcome. Right, because you can, that's why we spend so much time talking about focusing on process versus outcome. Right? It's all about controlling your process. Navy SEALs don't think about their, the outcome. They think about the process. They execute every single step with precision. And the, the work, what mental toughness is, is staying out of that outcome. Quit trying to predict. Stay in the present moment. Maximize every single little detail, little step. Learn to shut your brain off. Let the unconscious mind take over, especially in sports. Um, and, and so it's a lot of internal trust, internal belief. Um, one thing I talk to athletes about is you, you can't control all these different things, but what you can control is your internal process. So how quickly can you bring your thoughts back inward? How much belief do you have in your ability? Not confidence. Confidence comes and goes. That's that, that. I think confidence is pretty much crap. Um, I don't even talk about it. It's about your drive. It's about your belief. I mean, people start wars. People kill other humans over beliefs. So beliefs are super powerful. And if you don't have that belief, I don't know how you're going to maximize performance. And and beliefs have nothing to do with outcomes, other teams, referees things like that. Belief comes from what you develop inside yourself, what you know to be true. And, and then you, you continuously try and build that belief, strengthen that belief, and, and it becomes your core. So, so when you are struggling mentally now, Donovan, it's more how I'm understanding this. 
it's the person struggling with their belief system then more so than the lacking in confidence. Right. I mean, that could be from the ego getting in the way. That could be because, um, you know, one of, one of the things we talk about a lot is one of the guarantees of life is suffering. And so you're going to get some things that you can't control, you can't avoid, and you can't impact. And you have to deal with it. You have to persevere through it. You can't control time. You know, as much as you want things to happen on your agenda, they're not going to. You're not that powerful. And so a lot of a lot of it, when we start to lose our mental health or our anxiety start to get the best of us, it's, it's really a stepping back process. It's making things simple and small. Um, I do a lot in the summertime. I do these really intense outdoor trips where we take people and we train them for weeks on end. And then we go do an expedition for 11, 12 days. And all you have is what's on your back. You know, we're talking 70, 80 miles, 7,000 feet of elevation, rock climbing, rappelling, all of this stuff. And you do that because you start to realize, you know, this tiny little thing in my backpack is really important. Not, not, not all the stuff in my house, not like my car, and not like, you know, all the stuff I might want. Really, these tiny little things are very important. They're near and dear to me. And it makes life really simple. And when you're standing on top of that mountain, you realize you don't matter quite as much as you think. And that's a good thing for anxious people to always remember, that humility, that ability to step back and say, you know what, that's my anxiety making things big. That's my anxiety pushing my thoughts out to the future. That's my anxiety pulling things from the past that are insecurities to justify my fears. No, 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 no. That's all true. But you need to step back from that and realize you're not that important. You're not that big. Let's get back to work. And then it goes back to what I said previously. Let's perform. Let's get our process where it needs to be. And let's do that every single day. And if, if you maximize your process day in and day out, your outcomes will probably be pretty darn good. So do you think in your opinion now, Donovan, society – obviously coming out of the, the, the bubble that is sport obviously magnifies the outcome exponentially. Sure. Yeah, I think, I think society does it. I think the money does it. Uh, but that's the part of sports I get real passionate about is that I think because we do that, we lose the human part of sport. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of athletes that have problems off the field. And the first thing we do is judge them. And, and, you know, there's a lot of people I own a, I own a pretty big private practice in the town I live in. And there's a lot of people that come in here with a lot of problems. And so why is it that a pro athlete because of the outcomes and the money is expected to be, you know, protected or, or benign from having the same kind of problem? There's a, there's a lot of couples that deal with infidelity. Just because Tiger Woods did it doesn't mean he's, you know, a freak of nature because he's a great golfer. He's a human being. And so to approach them that way, I see it as, as a lot of people just see these athletes as, as a, you know, what can we get from them? We're consumers of them. So I want this from them. I want that from them. I need them to play this way, to win this Super Bowl, to make this money, to fill this stadium. But when the human element comes up, especially in the NFL, now there's no, we're going to say there's mental health because it sounds good, but at the same time, you're going to lose your game check. You're going to get fined. You're going to get fined by the league and the team. You, your contracts have all kinds of clauses built in that you may have to pay back guaranteed monies, things like that. So if a person has a problem, you should recognize the problem. You should understand the problem. You should help them recognize and understand the problem. You should help them get healthy. But we don't do that to athletes. We take a very punitive, negative approach to them. And, and all you have to do is look at, in my home state, Indianapolis, when Andrew Luck decided to turn it, you know, that guy went to Stanford. Do you know how, how few of people that are making judgments about him could even get into Stanford? Like, he values himself, his family, his brain, his education, 
And by all accounts, before he retired, everybody that was upset with him would have told you he's a great guy, even though they don't know him. So, but the moment it impacts you, you know, now my team isn't going to be as great or we're not going to sell as many tickets or we've lost a Nike endorsement or something like that. How dare he? And I think that's absolutely ridiculous. And that's why there's a service I've designed that we, we call it the rapid response crisis care. And, and I love this service because what it is, is it's, it, it has nothing to do with me. I just show up. I'm going to do my psych evaluation. I'm going to take all my knowledge and research that I've shared some with you about these guys coming up and being in a survival mindset. I'm going to write a plan and I'm going to show, Hey, this guy has an issue. He's dealing with it. And yeah, he dealt with it incorrectly. That's why he got arrested. But now he understands it. Here's what we're going to do about it. And give that power back to the athlete, the agent, the people that are in that guy's corner to control their narrative. Go on TV and say, hey, my guy has depression and he did this. And all of a sudden, all those people that want to you know, take away from you are going to go, oh, well, we can't take that away because he's got a problem, so we're going to support him. And this has been proven. There's other athletes in the NFL that have come out with mental health issues, and as soon as they admit that they have a mental health issue and they're working on it, their contract goes up. They make more money. But if you have the same issue and you keep the mental health issue at bay and you close that down, people are just going to judge you as being a bad person, making bad choices, a bad teammate. And so your contract and your money is going to keep going down. And the way the world sees you is going to be very different. And I think it's ridiculous to not have the athlete himself or herself be in control of their lives that way. You know, the, the media and the sponsorship should not dictate who you are. But then does this not come back to the initial, the argument that you raised first and foremost? You're either going towards uh, the problem or, or shying away from it. Well, sure. And I think, I think what the rapid response is all about is saying, we're not going to shy away from it. You know, we're going to, we're going to look it in the eye and we're going to understand it and we're going to do something about it. We're not scared of it. We're not ashamed of it. We're going to be honest about it and deal with it. And that's, that's what it takes to be great at anything. You have to be transparent like that with yourself, with other people. And you have to be willing that, to admit, Hey, I made a mistake. And it's not that I'm apathetic about it, but lots of, lots of growth comes from mistakes or suffering or pain or discomfort. Where do you think growth happens? Growth doesn't happen when you're comfortable. I mean, in any environment, there's got to be some discomfort to create growth. And so if you own this kind of discomfort, you're going to create growth. So where, where does this, I'll call it myth, come from where people believe that they can go the opposite direction and, and, and have success? Um, I think that just goes back to there is no psychology theory that I'm aware of that doesn't have a, a very in-depth section about how human beings are good at living in denial, distorting truth and thought. Um, it takes people years to, to want to deal with things like this. Um, it's hard. You know, it, it's, it's, it's way easier to go through McDonald's. It tastes good. It's cheap. It's fast. And, and you know what? You'll get the Diet Coke and you'll lie to yourself. And you'll say, it, I only do this once in a while and it's okay and it's not that big a deal. You know you're full of shit. You know that stuff's terrible for you. You know it's not going to be good for you, and it's not going to make you feel good or anything like that. But we'll still do it. I mean, McDonald's sells a lot of hamburgers, man. So um, there's no shortage of humans' ability to live that way. And so being willing to step away from that comfort, um, one, of the, one of the kind of sayings I use all the time is, you can't have achievement and relief at the same time. So it's really about what do you, what do you want? If you want relief, 
McDonald's is great. If you want achievement, you're going to have to work a little harder. You're going to have to be inconvenienced. You're going to have, there's going to have to be something because the world's more geared towards relief than achievement. You know, it's easier to procrastinate and put it off than to just get the, get the job done. But has that changed over time then? Because be it you go back generations, they had a, I'd, I'd probably, I don't mind throwing myself under the bus with this. I would say a better work ethic than maybe my generation and obviously the ones moving forward. Yeah, I, I, I feel pretty strongly about this, that um, somewhere along the way, and I don't know that I have the answer as to what, what did it, okay? But, but there's a woman, um, her last name's Duckworth, and she's done this amazing research on this thing called GRIT. G-R-I-T, grit. And she talks about how grit has two main components. It's got the persistence part, right? So show up and do the work over and over and over. Be persistent. And then it's got the part where it talks about purpose, or she may call it passion. I call it purpose. And I think we've lost that side of it. I, I think when I'm working with division one athletes and I give them these grit tests, it's overwhelmingly, you know, the, the persistence score is going to be up in the 70th percentile, but the passion or the purpose score is going to be down in the 30th. So they know how to show up and they know how to run those lines and do those drills, but they're not really sure why, you know, they don't, they don't cultivate that side of it. And I think it's really hard to sustain a work ethic over a lifetime or as a group of humans or a generation, so to speak, if you're not encouraged to think about your purpose. And typically a really good purpose transcends yourself. It's bigger than you. It's not about you. It's about impacting others and the world and communities. And, you know, that's what drives you. And so that's why the, the best athletes, in my opinion, are athletes that understand their sport is a platform to help them maximize their purpose and and that's what it's really about well what is your purpose because you can't you can't really say your purpose is to make the world a better place in some form or fashion and then be you know a great athlete but a terrible husband that that's you're a hypocrite now so purpose is this thing that i think we've lost in generations over time we just don't talk about it we tell our high school kids study get do these achievement tests get good SAT scores, go to a good school, get a business degree, go be in business because business people make money and they can afford their mortgage and it's safe and it's good. But that kid has no purpose or passion in business. They don't know why they would do it. They just know everybody's told them to do it. That's why when you go to your favorite high-end restaurant, ask your waiter what their business degree, what school they got their business degree at because they're smart enough to go be waiters at high-end restaurants so (laughs) and I don't mean to be rude about that but they don't know how to cultivate that degree you know you gotta your purpose is how you take that education apply it to something you love that you're passionate about and you'll probably make that happen because you care but I think we've lost the emphasis on the purpose but you, you wouldn't you have thought that the athlete per se doesn't matter what sport it is would be able to push back against that. I'm, I'm going to call it a stereotype, but it it, it is to a certain extent is a stereotyping. Yeah. Wouldn't they be able to be? If I use American football as the analogy, that like practice drills from a perspective of the lineman, that is their purpose within the sport is to block or or get through the offensive line. So why couldn't they reframe it from a different perspective to be able to not contradict what they're being told, but question it? Well, because I think, you know, Duckworth says purpose is broken into three components, right? And the first component is when you're young, you just love it. And I think, you know, that's, that's one of the saddest things you hear doing my job. You ask an athlete, why do you do this? And if they don't say that it's really fun, I love it, I do it for free. Like if you don't hear the love part and you're doing my job, you start to worry a little bit. Um, So it starts with just this pure joy. You know, I have a daughter. She's a really great softball player. I've never in my lifetime told her to go practice 
Um, but I've often told her, it's enough. You need to come in now, you know, and, and nobody's ever told her to do it. She just loves it. And, and I mean, it brings her joy. And then once you get into like college years and things like that, it's more about how do I take this thing that I love and develop it? How do I maximize it? What can I turn it into? And I think that's where we lose it. I really do. I think, I think we lose the focus on that because we start focusing on outcomes. We got to win or lose, you know, the, the stakes are really high in college sports. If you lose too many games, that coach is going to get fired. I mean, that's how that goes. So if you're not winning, you're trying to keep your job. So, you know, the outcomes, persistence gets way more emphasis than purpose. But if you analyze like the best teams, you know, think about, um, I read a story about the coach from Kentucky basketball once and, and he, he, there's this kind of story where their team beat another team by a whole lot, but then he was really upset because he had the minute mark that they let up and they didn't play with purpose. You know, they still won. The outcome was good and they won by a lot, but they didn't play at the level they needed to play. They didn't play with purpose. And so you have your individual purpose, you have your collective purpose. You know, you see this in, in college sports when they rally around maybe a, a, a kid who has cancer or something like that. It's bigger than yourself. And then as you get into adulthood past the college ages, now you're trying to make it transcend yourself. And so it's, it's can you get through all three of these stages without certain things kind of squashing that or shutting it down? Can you find a mentor or a support system or a team that says, hey, that's a crazy idea, but that's your purpose. Go make it happen. Um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of people in graduate school when you tell them, you're going to, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take kids and families and adults out in the woods and I'm going to put them on ropes courses and make them do all this crazy, like military-esque stuff. And it's going to be super therapeutic, really beneficial. They're going to pay me money to do it. It's going to be great. And I'm going to work with athletes and universities and pros. Nobody says yes when you tell them that's what you're going to do. Except there's been a couple of people in my life that were, and they understood that I, I wasn't asking you if I could do it. I'm telling you, this is my purpose. I know this is what I'm meant to do because when I'm in those environments, that's where I feel at home, the most comfortable. That's where I can see I've made impact. I get feedback from those individuals that have these experiences that we share and, and it's beneficial to them. Um, I have a drawer in my desk with all the cards or all the, all the notes I've ever gotten from all the, the kids and adults I've worked with. And that, that is the most important thing. That drawer is more important than any degree, any amount of money, any, you know, cool. Oh, I got to be on the sidelines. That was cool. You know, that, that drawer is more important because that drawer is the purpose. That's why you do the job. And so when you lose sight of that purpose and you don't have people to cultivate it along those three stages, I think the world's scary enough, big enough that you go back into that anxious fear response and you just put the nose to the grindstone and you cancel out the purpose and just try to maximize the persistence. And I think that message gets reinforced as good. You should do that. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, to finish my thought here, um, Stay at home, middle class, white moms are one of the most depressed populations in North America because no one's purpose is to clean up other people's socks, underwear, cook, dishes, vacuum. That is not their purpose, but they are put into that role and they're expected to be thankful and enjoy it and appreciate, you know, my kids and things like that. Well, Daniel Gilbert from Harvard proved a long time ago that people rate vacuuming their carpet as bringing more joy than child rearing when you have little kids. But you can't say that to people because they get really defensive. Well, yeah, because the job's so hard. You get defensive because you have to do such a hard job every day. So, but your purpose as a middle-aged adult is not to like wipe poop off of a baby. 
your purpose is greater than that. And so they sacrifice their purpose. And people don't appreciate that sacrifice nearly enough. Most people couldn't handle that. That's probably why they get depressed. So purpose is this massively misunderstood um, key element to health. And I think most of the time we get so focused on persistence that we forget to balance it out with purpose. But obviously coming back to your earlier point as well, in terms of you saying that you were content with going the way you were going to go, do you think the people that were going were gonna to say no to you felt uncomfortable and to a certain extent fearful if they were put in the same predicament? It's, a, it's an area I'm not in control of, so I'm fearful of it. Oh, for sure. And I, I think what we do in, in treatment or in, in our work together is start to figure out how do you take that unknown, break it down into increments, and, and start to really like this idea of I'm going to get uncomfortable and then I'm going to grow. And then I'm going to get uncomfortable and then I'm going to grow. And, I'm going, and you just repeat that process to the point where you really like the idea of getting uncomfortable. Um, you know, I talk about these four foundations where people need to have exercise and they need to use their exercise as catharsis and challenge. So every week or, or multiple times a week, you need to get a little uncomfortable. You need to put a little extra weight on there, push yourself to go a little further or faster. You need to step into that little unknown space and and get that anxiety up there and then achieve. And that's gonna that's how you keep that belief strong and, and nurture it. You gotta sleep, right? Anxious people don't sleep very well. It's like closing the laptop. You don't power it down, you just shut the screen, pop it back open. Um, Stanford did a bunch of research about how if you have a set bedtime, set wake up time, and no screens a half hour before bed your brain will get more REM sleep, your brain will process everything, and without even doing anything, that's not even a coping strategy, you'll just feel better because the anxiety will regulate itself more normally. Uh, You have to have a a healthy diet. I mean, food is fuel. That's what it is. So if you put junk in there and you're an anxious person, there's such a thing as somatic anxiety where it affects how you feel. You know, we've, we've heard about athletes that puke right before they go play. Well, if you put junk in your body and your body doesn't feel right, your anxiety is going to go a little haywire. And then you got to have some kind of passion. You got to have something to focus that mind on that's healthy, that brings in joy. You know, I, I, I plan these crazy trips that we take people on all year long. And it brings me a lot of joy to, well, maybe we could go here this year. Maybe we could go there. Well, no, I'm going to take my kid to this one and scout it out. That, that, yeah, I need that. That's a work trip. But, you know, and so like it brings in this joy, but it lasts for a long time. It's it's not a short term thing. Um, And it's the combination of doing those four things every day. And so I tell people those four things have to be on point, like brushing your teeth. You just do them. And nobody nobody draws attention to themselves for brushing their teeth. They don't like wear a T-shirt. They don't put it on Facebook or Instagram. They don't expect somebody to be like, hey. Well done. You brushed your teeth. I'm really proud of you. They, that, that's how it has to be. It's just these are the four things I do to keep a strong foundation in my life. If I can't do that, I probably can't do higher level change, like deal with my ego and dissect the unknown and adopt a, a, a growth mindset and these types of things. I, I'm not going to be able to do that if I can't manage these four things and create a foundation for me to grow from. Obviously, you mentioned a good point there, Donovan, in terms of, you know, brushing your teeth. Why do people not question that as a loop process? And then when you question them on other things, be it you brought up a a great point in terms of the diet, why do they have a difficulty being consciously aware of being, uh, being in a negative pattern when we obviously take brushing our teeth for granted? Uh, because I think people are so quick to give up on themselves. Um, you know, you, you have to care about yourself enough to take care of yourself. And so to do those four things, you have to value yourself. You have to value your health. And what I hear just from the people I work with, 
it, it's just the same stuff that everybody would say. Well, I just don't have time for that. Or, well, my kids are in sports now, so I, I don't have time to do this. Or we don't have time to eat, so we just drive through and grab stuff. And, you know, there's a million reasons, and all of those reasons are probably valid. You know, I, I don't really try and make people feel bad by saying that's an excuse or any of that. Sure, that's all true, but none of that's ever going to go away either. So it's not about like, how do I do, how do I get my kid's schedule to be convenient for me so I can go do these things? Nope, you probably are going to have to get up at like four o'clock in the morning and go do it. That's probably what's going to have to happen because you can't do it any other time. So but if you love yourself and you care about yourself enough, you'll get up at four o'clock in the morning and go do it. So it's not about convenience. It's about self-care. And, and that's the big difference is I think people don't see it as self-care. I think they see it as, you know, uh, something above that. And, and it's not. These are just basic human needs that have to be met. Is that why people go on the defensive when you, you, you probe them and question them on it then? Oh, for sure. Yeah, because they feel guilty. They know, they know they should be doing it. They don't need some guy to tell them they should be doing that. Um, I think sometimes they like having a discussion because they realize two things when we have this discussion. You're either going to do it for yourself because you love yourself or something bad is going to happen. and then you're going to have a choice and you can start to care about yourself and go down that path of recovery and health and healing, or you can have this bad thing happen, dwell on it, have a negative mindset and continue down the path. And more bad things are probably going to happen to you. And, and most of these things are beyond your control. So the thing you can control are like these four things we're talking about right now. But why, why does it take an extreme for people to generate, uh, take action? And why are people not more proactive? Because people are willing to put their hands in the suffer. And when people are really stubborn, and people are really busy, and lives are really complicated. And so, you know, for a lot of people, it takes something really big. And, and it's sad. And, and I... I try and explain this to them because I have these pictures that I show and these are very graphic pictures from when I had cancer and it's, it's, it's the, it's basically my kidney being operated on and I show it to them and I say, you can either wait for something like this and, and that's going to be suffering. There's a lot of pain, a lot of bad things that come with that, or you could suffer by giving up a little bit of sleep and working a little harder at the gym or eating a little healthier because that's that kind of suffering is going to make you feel good that's how you're going to produce growth for yourself so you're either going to give it to yourself or life's going to give it to you i probably just choose both i probably just give myself enough suffering so that when life gives it to me i'm good to go but but wouldn't the argument for that be that people would say that's sitting on the fence a little bit in terms of taking a little pinch of, of both sides and you're not really sitting on one side or the other. Well, I mean, I, I see how you're saying that, but like you can't control whether or not you're going to get cancer. You don't know. So, but if you just do statistical analysis, the likelihood you or someone in your immediate family is going to get cancer is about 100%. So the fact that you're going to have to deal with it, it's going to happen. You better get ready. Well, obviously people don't want to, well, they don't want to think like that in the first place, do they? They don't want to think of the, well, I'm not going to say the inevitable, but that something that could arise that's going to have a massive impact on them or their, their immediate family. Yeah, and I don't know how that's helpful or healthy. So... Um, I'd rather be prepared and ready to win because you can beat cancer. You can win that battle, but not if you're, if you're not prepared. And I know this because I was not prepared. It will, it will take you to the brink. It will, it will make you think you can't win. 
But if I got cancer today, that would not happen at all. It would be a completely different experience. But is that more physical or mental then? That, that, that's the more of the chip. Both. 100%. Physical, mental, emotional, uh, in my relationships, in my entire life, everything would be at a much higher level if that diagnosis came in today. Because does you, that, but does that ahead. come back to the, be that, you know, the this, this, this sporting... Uh, what, what what we take for granted, obviously, is preparation. Sport takes oh. as, that's a, that's that's a no brainer. I have to do that. I need to prepare for a game. I need to practice to prepare for practice. But when it comes time to the probably the real the real situation, do you think it's, we're unprepared? Massively, massively unprepared. We would much rather live in a world where we just don't think about it or feel bad for other people that are going to have to deal with that, but it won't happen to me. Uh, there's a, there's as many ideas as you could possibly think of are, are the ideas of how people try and hide from that. Um, and that's why I do bring it back kind of full circle here to clinical psychology because clinical psychology is the bell curve. It's statistics. It's taking this theory. It's applying this theory, studying this theory, seeing what parts of the theory actually come out and they're quanti- quantifiable. And then you start to see, I mean, there's a reason that a person with a very high IQ works one way. A person with an average IQ works one way and a person with a very low IQ works one way. And although we can't predict a hundred percent of how these people work because everyone's individual, we know enough about it that we have certain inferences that we are extremely certain about. They reach certain cutoff levels, you know, the, in our statistical analysis. And if you do that same thing with something like what we're talking about, cancer, or the risk of injury in, in the NFL, I mean, these are inevitable things. The likelihood you're going to not get injured is almost zero. So, to think that I don't have to have that mindset that I'm never going to have to deal with injury is just absurd. You have to, you have to have that mindset. You have to, in my opinion, you have to look at those numbers, accept those numbers as truth and then decide, okay, those numbers are true. So I'm going to put myself in the best position possible so that when those numbers, it comes to me in my individual life, I'm ready and I'm going to be okay. And that's how I try and marry the two. I try and take this clinical knowledge, this statistical knowledge, you know, to go back to grit. Duckworth taught us that West Point cadets, their grit is at the 80th percentile or above. So if, if, if you want to be that kind of human being, but your purpose is all the way back at the 30th percentile, well, you got, you got a reality check you got to deal with here. And that's not me being harsh or rude or, that's me genuinely trying to help you. I want to help you cultivate that because I want you to be at that 80th percentile and above. Because you don't, you don't hear a lot of people that are high achievers like that that are real upset. They're pretty happy people. They're pretty secure people, but in very different ways, you know. They, they don't really care about what they wear. They don't care about, you know, the... You've probably met, I hope you've met some really brilliant doctors that drive like a 1984 Honda Civic held together with duct tape. They don't need a Ferrari, you know, but they can do brain surgery for crying out loud because they, they know their purpose and they minimize all the other stuff to maximize what their purpose is, what their passion is. So I think the statistics side of things helps us prioritize, helps us prepare, helps us see a more accurate and full picture of how life really is. And then we attach all the growth mindset, those four principles, purpose, passion, persistence. Um, and how do, you, how do you deal with the anxieties that are going to come along with this and self-regulate to get yourself to where you want to be in life, which is the best version of yourself. And do you think, Donovan, obviously, and this is my penultimate question to you, do you think when it comes to collegiate sports, when it comes down to the, the, the um, service academies, obviously those young men and women 
know their purpose because once they finish school, they're going to go serve others. Do you think that's what makes the difference between them and maybe what we'll call the day, the the normal uh, collegiate athlete that you're going to find at another university or institution? Right, and I, and I think to go back to Duckworth, what we really found, or what she really found in psychology was the even though you got into West Point because you had all these tests and and accolades and letters of support, a lot of those first-year students still didn't, they quit or they dropped out or they were asked to leave. And so this grit factor is what becomes the underlying backbone of who's successful. So when you're all really talented, when you're all really smart, when you're all really fast, when you're all really whatever, what separates that? Well, that seems to be this grit factor. And grit, like I keep saying, is a big part of that. It's your purpose. So um, I think that's what kind of is underneath the talent and the hard work and all of that. And my final question to you before we wrap up the episode then is, if you have to summarize what we've been speaking about today into one sentence for people to take away, what would that be? One sentence for the psych guy. That's a challenge right there. Um, right, stretch it to a, um, a hypothesis then. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think how I would sum it up is if you're willing to change your mind to a growth mindset, become self-aware, and learn how to self-regulate, you can achieve in all areas of your life, what you're seeking, which is to be the best version of yourself possible in all your roles and inside of yourself, have confidence, belief, and security. And that's, that's really the name of the game. So Donovan, once again, thanks for coming on the Mindset Athlete Podcast. Oh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Must be my absolute pleasure. All right, take care. If you like this episode, please do share it with your friends and do let Donovan and I know what you thought of the episode by tagging us over on Instagram at Martin underscore Donovan and at James O. Roberts 11. And that is the number 11. And you can do the same on Twitter and Facebook. And if you had any questions, don't hesitate to shoot them over as well. And finally, don't forget to check out his website, DonovanMentalPerformance.com. And as always, do check out my free content at fitamputee.co.uk and click on the tab resources. But not forgetting, I've also started a new Facebook group, especially for the podcast, which you can find by typing in The Mindset Athlete. So make sure to check those out. The links will be in the description. You can find all the show notes at mindsetgame.lipson.com under the category psychology. So once again, thanks for listening and I'll catch you next week for another episode of the Mindset Athlete Podcast.